Well, while we're uh, working on this, I'll, I'll just start talking a little bit. That uh, Good afternoon. My name is Bobby Mahaj, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk here today. And uh, I will say that one common thread or the common denominator of what we're talking about here today is that, honestly, India uh, is in a very unique uh, position right now in terms of growth and the development of thoracic oncology programs. Um, you know, when we talk about the different types of modalities to get out to lung nodules, to biopsy them, um, ablative techniques, and we've, what we've discussed with Kelvin as well, is it's just one of those situations where we're on the cusp of really great things here in India. Um, and I, I joke uh, that my father is a pulmonologist as well, so I, I'm not as original as everyone else in the room, but um, he trained here in India. He, uh, he went to the United States and been practicing for about 50 years now. And when I told him, yeah, I'm coming here to talk about kind of the next options for lung cancer, bringing these kind of technologies to the United States, um, you know, he said, you know, you should look at this place where they need another pulmonologist because it's nice and it's, it's up and coming. And I told him, there's a ton of IP docs here. It's great. It's the, the ability and what they're going to be doing in the near future is, is really um, second to none. And he goes, you dummy, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. Do they need another pulmonologist to come over to India and, and, and work? Um, but, but in all seriousness, the, the big thing that he was very excited about is that the, the focus on lung health is really changing in India. And I think that's one of the few times that, um, unlike the United States in a lot of ways, a lot of these different platforms have been working to try and perfect what they're capable of doing. Now we're actually seeing that uh, effect in the, from the United States here in India. So you've heard a lot of different modalities um, and different ways of biopsying today, but the most important thing is what is right for your program, what's right for India, and, and moving forward, it's, it's a very unique situation where you can have this many different types of um, speakers talking about different types of ways to biopsy, whether it be by a bronchoscope, by a robot, um, by uh, visual or fluoroscopy using tomosynthesis. So um, I would say that you know we're, we're set up for success here in India for sure. Thank you. So I was able to give you guys a little break uh, in order to do this. So thanks again for having me. So uh, my name is Bobby Mahajan. And really what we're talking about, like I said, is different modalities to actually get images um, and ensure that you're biopsying appropriately. These are my conflicts of interest. Uh, I should not be relevant here. But, you know, one thing like I talked about is that, you know, the change in terms of what we're achieving in India is, is really fascinating. And looking at lung cancer in India is very different uh, than what we look at in the United States. And I was told a couple, you know, uh, days ago, is there's no really point in showing the data from the United States, frankly, in terms of lung cancer incidents and, and treatment, because it's just different. And uh, the idea of us being here and talking about these different modalities is to hopefully bring these type of capabilities to India so that we can improve the outcomes with surgery um, and diagnosis of lung cancer. So lung cancer still remains in India the most common cause of cancer um, and the highest mortality rate. When we talk about where these incidents are occurring, you see the, in the black, there's a lot of lung cancer on that screen throughout the country. And we are, our goal is to cut into that, diagnose it early, move it towards surgery and curative approaches, and really improve our five-year survival. Because really, in India right now, the five-year survival rate is dismal, just like it is in the United States in terms of 15%. It's improved in the United States, and part of that is because we have improvement in diagnosis and we have improvement in surgical techniques. When we deal with a lung cancer, this is one of my kind of favorite slides, um, is you know, when you see a nodule, trying to identify this as a high risk or a low risk nodule or an inter intermediate risk nodule. In, in looking at low risk nodules, it, it isn't a hard decision. Someone who has a very small, stable nodule, we don't technically have to worry about biopsying that. High risk nodule is not bad either because the diagnostic yield is high uh, with different types of modalities to biopsy, but also we know these need to come out. Most importantly and most challenging are the intermediate risk. They have a smoking history, they have concern in terms of what this nodule looks like, but they may be not of the appropriate age. So really what we want to be able to do is biopsy these and resect these. Importantly though also, this is the end goal, is getting these nodules out early and shifting the stage of, of diagnosis from a late stage cancer to an early stage cancer. 
But this isn't easy. We talk about just taking them out. Uh, but the incidence of benign resections can be really unacceptable in a lot of places. You know, 20 that we talked about earlier today, 23% of a benign resection rate. We're putting patients through a risky surgery, even though minimally invasive, that they don't, shouldn't go through unless we have a diagnosis. There's a ton of ways of diagnosing lung nodules, and I, I think we've kind of talked about this ad nauseum in terms of uh, needle aspiration, traditional bronchoscopy, which doesn't have the ideal uh, yields, and then watchful waiting. But one thing we have to remember in, in terms of watchful waiting is that these are patients' lives who are worrying about a lung cancer. And just saying, well, we're going to wait six, eight months and see what happens to the lung cancer can be challenging, especially in a high-risk patient. So we have to have those modalities to biopsy, and one of those is needle biopsy. And, and don't get me wrong, in the, right, in the right situation, a needle biopsy is appropriate. But what we have to think about is not just the picture of the diagnosis, but the entire stage and diagnosis during our procedures. And if we can combine those with something that's minimal risk, um, that's ideal. And here, when we look at needle biopsies, especially in the setting of uh, emphysema, the incidence of a pneumothorax can be high, anywhere from 50 to 60 percent if the lobe uh, holds uh, emphysema that the, where the nodule is. So what do we try and do and how can we try and improve our appro uh, approach to diagnosis? We have to have, again, multiple modalities to do so. One of those is we've talked about navigation and Kelvin kind of brought this up, first of all from a, from a treatment standpoint, but I also want to talk about how we get out to those nodules. And we consider, again, electromagnetic navigation, where these are virtual images to get out to nodules. The question isn't getting out to the nodule, but the biopsy and the nodule have to represent the actual tumor or the nodule. And this is how we look at this. So this is a, a navigation out to the nodule. The green ball is representative of the nodule. And what we do is plan this nodule prior to uh, the actual procedure, navigate out to it, and then know that we're in front of the nodule. The challenge we run into is making sure the nodule that is representing by the green ball is actually the tumor that we're trying to biopsy. Some ways of doing that when you get out there with a catheter-based navigation profile is to say, look, we're going to confirm it with radial EBIS. And that's one of my favorite things. I, I want to get out there and know objectively in a real-time approach that we actually see the nodule. And when you see this, you know, your, your heart lights up, man. We know we're in the middle of the nodule. We're going to get a diagnosis. Uh, but the challenge we run into is this is not always what we see. And part of that is because a virtual image is virtual. We need some kind of real-time um, kind of update. If we do get to that point with the Lumicide platform, you end up navigating out, you biopsy. There are a number of biopsy tools, but really what it comes down to is a tool uh, a platform to get out, it doesn't matter if the uh, imaging platform doesn't improve and make sure that you're looking at the nodule itself. And when we take these biopsies, this is what our goal is. Not only to take a di get a diagnosis, get adequate uh, tissue for any molecular markers that may be possible, and also we need to be able to sometimes put in fiducials or dye mark as, um, as AB discussed. But the bigger question is what do we do in terms of making up for the fact that the CT scan when it's taken any time between a week, sometimes a month before the procedure, is actually representative of where the nodule is. Now, it can be challenging, okay, because if we look at where the CT scan was taken and where the nodule is based on the, the moving lung, there's divergence, and we call that CT to body divergence. We've thrown that around a lot today. And what that means is when you take a CT scan when you're awake, one week, two weeks before the, CT, before the procedure, you're at typically TLC. You're taking a large breath. When we undergo anesthesia, those breaths reduce. You get more atelectasis, and as a result, the nodule itself can move anywhere from two to three centimeters based on those, uh, the difference between when you actually had the CT scan and the procedure. And this is what we have to make up for, and this is where the imaging component is so important. By improving our imaging, knowing where we are, we know we're biopsying. And as you see, you know, this nodule is moving as the actual procedure is going, is going on because of breath breathing. We can't really do a continuous breath hold in these patients, obviously, because that's not compatible with life. We want to avoid that. So what do we talk about? There's different things that cause CT to body divergence, and really what we focus on is in these patients who we do adequate uh, ventilation strategies, it really does come from a tidal volume breathing versus a TLC breath. So how can we improve that? And part of that is the ability to have intraoperative uh, visualization of those nodules and taking those fluoro negative uh, or fluoro uh, not visible nodules and making them visible. And this is, uh, I think, a, a picture from, from Krish uh, when he did these studies. But there you see on the left, there was no obvious, you can't see the nodule very well. On the right, after enhancement of that nodule, you can see it very clearly and make the appropriate adjustments. 
And this is really what the goal of the Lumisite platform is to improve visualization. So um, it really provides enhanced visualization by doing a tomosynthesis spin, local registration to help compensate for that CT to biodivergence. And, and frankly, it just allows you to get to smaller nodules. So when they brought this to me, I said, all right, guys, you want to really show me if it works? Let's actually do something challenging as opposed to kind of a, a, a softball. So I took a nodule sitting on the diaphragm that was not uh, floral visible initially. We enhanced it, and we can see the nodule. The challenging part is if you look at where the, the catheter is in relation to where that nodule is, we were off. By enhancing it, I made adjustments. We were able to move over to the nodule appropriately and get adequate biopsies. So the workflow is a little different. We navigate out, obviously, but then we improve our visualization by doing a tomosynthesis spin. Um, and that allows us to enhance the nodule, make updates to where our catheter is, and biopsy. And this is the idea behind this tomosynthesis spin, is that essentially you're taking information from multiple angles, culminating them, and actually enhancing our visualization of the nodule. I I'm running a little short because of every kind of my computer delays, but I'll show you that we navigate out to this nodule, and this is the virtual target. So we're no, we are based on our initial move in the right place. But again, things change. And now we're doing our spin, the tomosynthesis. You see the nodule is not visible at this point. Uh, but we take this data and we wait. We want to make sure that we can update appropriately. After navigating out and taking a look at these nodules, what we're able to say is that how do we get to the right place? Oops, sorry about that. And how do we make sure that our nodule is correct? So we end up doing those spins and we can see enhancement of these nodules. So again, on the left is a non-enhanced nodule. On the right, we can see the nodule clearly enhanced and our catheter is off to the left. We make an adjustment and we're able to get our diagnostic yield. If we look at these catheters in terms of biopsy, again, no, sub-centimeter nodules are typically non-issue at all. We're out to the lesion, it's not floral visible. We see now it becomes visible on the right, that small nodule next to the catheter, we make an adjustment and we biopsy. One of the benefits of this platform as well, in addition to being able to biopsy, we're able to actually make adjustments. And because that green ball is updated, we can use a pinpoint approach to update our where we biopsy itself. Another example that we look at are ground glass lesions. Now, again, ground glass lesions are on, honestly pretty uh, difficult to visualize on fluoro, but after its enhancement of the nodule, you can see that area that's a little bit more dark. And as a result, we adjust our catheter and we can biopsy safely, knowing that we're in the right place. Dye marking as well, I know we talked about this, that some of the thoracic surgeons have challenges in terms of taking biopsies, especially of ground glass opacities. This is really excellent for once you've navigated out, putting out dye versus um, different types of modalities to enhance the lesion. And these are what you can see during the dye marking phase, and the surgeon can resect these without difficulty. The other benefit that we didn't talk about too much is the ability to use EBIS at the same time as these biopsies. By taking these patients to the uh, bronchoscopy suite, biopsying the nodule, and staging at the same time, we've completed the entire process, and at the end of that procedure, we know the data that's necessary to move that patient forward in the care continuum and, and do surgical resection. So there's data. There's a lot of data when it comes to um, uh, uh, alumicide, and it's moved from a diagnostic yield from 67% to higher. Sometimes some of these are single center studies, so it's hard to really base a 97% yield. But really what we are seeing as the, the visualization improves, our biopsy yields have improved. And looking at this, uh, some of this information by, uh, by Krish and, and Mike who are in the crowd, you know, if we're able to take those updates in the nodules, those enhancements, are they really representative of the actual nodule? And comparing them to, uh, to cone beam CT, we're seeing that the improvement in terms of the diagnostic uh, accuracy of where that nodule is located visually is very, is very real. Uh, it's close to a 95% uh, diagnostic um, overlay of the cone beam image and the Florinav image. Furthermore, we want to see improvement in yields, right? None, none of this really matters if you're not getting patients diagnosed with more cancer at an earlier stage. Looking at some of the Vanderbilt data in terms of what... 
uh, looking at some of the diagnostic yields, but going from a 54% diagnostic yield to about a 79 diagnostic yield because of the fact that we have the ability to see these nodules more effectively. And again, looking at some of the uh, data out of um, uh, University of uh, Vanderbilt, looking at the ability to biopsy these more effectively, see these nodules, the yields go up to approximately 89, 83%. And finally, if we're talking about yields themselves, we see uh, Mark Bowling at uh, Eastern Carolina University, overall diagnostic yield of 87% with a 100% diagnostic yield with general anesthesia being used versus uh, moderate uh, sedation. So the bigger question here is what's next for India and why are these important? The goal here is to get a stage shift. We're diagnosing patients in India at a much later stage than we really need to. The other issue is that we need diagnostic biopsies before we take these patients to surgery. You know, these, the benign resections that end up showing that patients had TB or granulomas really isn't acceptable at this point. With the capabilities that the IP docs have here and what the different types of modalities that should be coming to this country in the near future. My hope is that in the next year to two years, because we have um, a different kind of conferences like this, we're going to see that industry, different types of platforms will come in and improve the ability to biopsy these early and may move patients through the care continuum more effectively. And this is why we have to look at not only lung cancer screening like we was talked about earlier, but also improving the ability to look at different AI techniques to identify incidental lung nodules, put together incidental lung nodule programs, and finally have an option for once we identify these nodules, biopsy them in much smaller sizes compared to what we're doing nowadays. So again, I want to thank you. Uh, this is my information if there's any questions. Um, and moving forward, I think I'm a little bit over time from that. So thank you very much.